Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 142. So glad you could join me. Uh, today's guest is Anna Evans. She'll be here in about 15 minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. No matter where you're watching this, whatever platform, there's something you can click that tells the algorithms that this is something to share. Then those, it'll show up in people's suggested videos, and more people watch, and the power of poetry will spread around the world, and it'll be a great thing. So make sure you click something um, right now if you would. Now, we always like to start with uh, Poets Respond and the news poems of the current week. And we have Mara Eve Robbins here with just it's a delightful poem. And that's a word you don't hear in poetry very often. But this was delightful. Uh, hey, Mara, how you doing? <laughs> the compliment, it also opens the poem, that delight. Yeah, it is wonderful. And I should say that you uh, are in a rural area, so you can't have video. So we just have you on audio, but there's no problem with that. Um, do you want to explain how the poem came to be? Um, what, what, what was it inspired it? Although it's kind of self-evident, but, uh, but, but there's a backstory to it, though. You know, there's a really long backstory to this. Um, I had read some of Ada Limon's work, but I really discovered her during the pandemic. Uh, she did a lot of readings and stuff like this via Zoom, you know, so that I could tap in and really found her work engaging and inspiring in terms of what she was writing about and just the way that she engaged with the world. And so there were several poems that were that were written kind of for or with her. And then a dear friend of mine in Richmond, Virginia, decided that he wanted to interview her for RVA magazine and wrote her a poem to demonstrate the sincerity of that desire. <laughs> and so it was kind of born not long before she became poet laureate. And all of these different pieces came together to form a poem that was very much in the immediacy of the moment. You know, it was very much like what was happening in that moment. And that to me, I think was important, you know, for this particular feature. Um, but also I've submitted to Poets Respond a lot because there's been a lot of news. <laughs> there has sure been is. a lot of poems. <laughs> and so it was particularly wonderful to me to write a poem that was about such good news. It was such good news to me on a day that a lot of other good news came into being. We're looking at pictures of the cosmos. It was Pima children's birthday. It was just, it was, it felt so good after just feeling pummeled by it. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the best poem I've written so far has been about that good news. <laughs> um, I think some of the other ones are just trying to get the bad news out of my system. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But first, let's uh, share this poem so people can uh, hear what we're talking about. An open letter to our new poet laureate. Do you want to go ahead and read it? I would love to. This opens with an epigraph from our new poet laureate, Ada Limon, from her poem, Give Me This. Why am I not allowed delight? There's pizza on the stove, Ada, along with a plate of July tomatoes and fresh mozzarella, because I was hungry until it was dark, and I want to send this before midnight. Even those tomatoes and fresh mozzarella are not tempting enough to trouble me because I wanna send this before midnight. It'll be easier to eat then. Today, what tempts me into trouble is you. Good trouble, like we wondered if it's still possible we will eat each other alive, human sushi wrapped in the ocean's dementia. You did so good tumbling into wonder. New shots of faraway cosmos reminding humanity wrapped in brackish forgetting. We're here with trees that swallow questions like shots with friendly camaraderie reminding us of biscuits or a seven foot black snake climbing the tree to swallow whole. No question, groundhogs, goldfinches, silvery fish. Biscuits for everyone I thought this might be for but you. I listened through all the things I didn't do while watching groundhogs, finches, silvery fish, 
You carried me through the worst of the fear. I'm listening to a playlist called Dead of July, eating the tomatoes, the worst of the fear already on my plate. So I grabbed pizza instead because I'm hungry now. It's dark. Yeah, just an excellent poem. And once again, that was um, an open letter to our new poet laureate by Mara Eve Robbins. And, and Mara, um, so the, the poem is in, um, in a pantoum form or a, a loose kind of pantoum form. Is there, is there a word for doing a pantoum like that? I would probably call it what you just did. I took a lot of liberties with the repetitions, you know, so that I could shift the meaning um, sometimes dramatically, but also tried to like use the word forgetting for dementia mm -hmm. um, because it, I, I wanted it to be conversational, but the poem itself became a pantoum when mm -hmm. I started writing it. So it was a challenge to use that form um, but also to keep it in a more, I wanted it to be a more conversational tone, yeah. you know? And, and you mentioned uh, just, it, it's rare to to read poems about, you know, something positive. And, and people ask for them all the time. Um, it, it's interesting, this kind of show, this episode is almost about what people ask for more of, because people are always asking for more formal poetry, and they're always asking for more positive poetry, and it's really hard to do. Do you have any thoughts about, about what it was like sitting down? Because usually poems are sort of almost problem-solving vehicles, like we're trying to figure out something that's like gnawing at us. And um, when, when it's something joyous, successful, huh? That is weird. Well, we're back. So sorry if anybody, uh, huh, this happened last week too. So we're gonna have to figure out what the uh, software glitch is and hope it doesn't happen again. But our stream cut out on my software level, not on the connection level. Um, but anyway, to continue the sentence, because it only lasted a minute, <laughs> or not even. Um, uh, so, so how is it that you confront a poem of joy when it's it's so common for poems to be um, written out of a place of, of difficulty? Uh, I think it helps if there's a lot of difficulty first, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because I, in this case, um, you know, it's been a dark time. We've had a global pandemic. We've had a lot of our rights stripped away from us. It's been. I mean, we tolerated extreme weather over here on the East Coast today. It's it's all the time, and um, and and yet it becomes even more important to notice those things that are beautiful, mm -hmm. to really appreciate those things that bring us joy. And sometimes that's almost a discipline, you know, finding finding some sort of hope somewhere. And I think that the way that Ada Limon has talked about. Um, finding humanity in all of this, like throughout a lot of her interviews, really just, I, I felt this sense similar to seeing Joey Harjo when she was poet laureate, that there is hope for us, mm -hmm. you know, that it's, it's difficult at times, but that, you know, we're each other's species, according to Maud from the movie Harold and Maud, and that it, it can bring out the best in each other when we face these kinds of challenges. Um, but it it takes something. I mean, this is a hopeful poem, and it's a poem about being allowed delight. Um, but it's definitely got darkness at its core too. It's dark, you know. It's like the grappling with that. I don't think you can have one without the other. I think writing a joyous poem without acknowledging that other side would be trite, um, and that's that's part of the challenge. Is incorporating more of that the dogs agree i apologize for the dogs barking <laughs> no in the um, that was really well said thanks so much for for sharing that and sharing this wonderful poem in, in the joy of um, good news for a change mara yeah thank you so much this is really an honor and um it's wonderful to finally be in poets respond with good news yeah, um, well, and and poetry in the news Actually, yeah, for sure. Poetry and, it, and it's good news about poetry, too, which is unusual, <laughs> especially. Yeah, thanks so much, Mara. It's just been a pleasure Thank talking you. to you. I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, that was Mara Eve Robbins. And um, we were talking about her poem, An Open Letter to Our New Poet Laureate. Um, we have a Tuesday poem coming up, too. And uh, Melissa Balmain couldn't be here, but she has a poem. And we, one of the one of the topics that we have a lot of poems about this week was, of course, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. And those are wonderful pictures. Uh, that it was broadcasting back, much even better than the Hubble, Hubble images. And uh, Melissa Balmain, who is, of course, the um, 
editor of uh, Light Quarterly, um, has a, another another happy kind of poem um, that we're going to share with you right now, Caught in the Web. And Melissa is, uh, can't be here at this time right now, but, um, but here she is reading Caught in the Web. So hold on and, and take a listen to this. Caught in the Web. If you held a grain of sand up to the sky at arm's length, that tiny speck is the size of Webb's view in this image. Imagine galaxies galore within a grain. NASA Webb Telescope's Twitter account. My morning news feed teems with shots of space, bright slopes and swirls of russet and vermilion that shelter hidden planets by the billion. Soon, soon, my puny brain will try to face the likelihood that everything I do is just a blip of no more real importance than goings on atop that speck of Horton's in Dr. Seuss's book, that I'm a who, and there's no God who gives a flip for me or anybody else as we are revolving among the other galaxies that hurtle, all dreaming, planning, acting pointlessly. Soon, soon I'll face this. Once I finish solving, ta-da, I did it. Spelling bee and Wordle. Yeah, so that was uh, Melissa Balmain with Caught in the Web. And um, um, I got to read her note too, because there's a great note at the bottom, something she noticed here. So she says, uh, yep, this was me. Um, I'll put it back on the screen. Um, yep, this was me in the morning. Uh, the morning the web photos came out. Fun fact, taken together, that day's spelling bee pangram and wordle solution formed the phrase night alchemy. Mere coincidence or proof that a higher power does, after all, care about our tiny pursuits. Discuss among yourselves, she says. So another uh, another happier, kind of lighter poem, uh, which is very fun for uh, for Tuesday. It's going to be tomorrow's featured poem on rattle.com. So hope you enjoyed that one. Um, now we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with today's main guest, Anna Evans. So hang tight, and I will be right back. And welcome back. Thanks for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is Anna M. Evans. Anna is the author of six books of poetry, most recently Under Dark Water, Surviving the Titanic, and The Quarantina Chronicles, which we have right here. Um, she gained her MFA from Bennington College and is a recipient of fellowships from the McDowell Artist Colony and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and winner of the 2012 Rattle Poetry Prize Reader's Choice Award winner um, for Zietberger. Um, which I cannot even remember what that word means. So maybe Anna can remind us later. Um, she currently teaches at West Windsor Arts Center and Rowan College at Burlington County, also where she's involved in, uh, in local politics, which might be something interesting to talk about. But here she is, Anna Evans. Hey, Anna, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you could be a guest. I mean, I've been a fan of your work for so long. Um, just is all the sort of group of able muse. I mean, we talk about the able muse all the time. It's such a great group of poets. And, mm -hmm. um, and you're one of the, the main poets up there in that in that group. 
Um, and so it's just really fun. And, you know, this whole episode is going to be full of formal poetry. So um, and that's going to be fun. I enjoy it. And um, people want it, even though they don't write it, which is always the, the, the things that drives me crazy. So um, so it'll be fun to, to share some of your work. But do you want to start out uh, with a poem to sort of give a sense of it? Yes, um, I'm going to start with the first uh, poem in Under Dark Waters, Surviving the Titanic. And I just want to address one thing that Mara said very wisely um, in the introduction. Uh, poems are, are, can't be just light or dark. They have to have two sides to them. And this entire book, which is, of course, about my mother's death, seen through the lens of the Titanic disaster, you think that has the propensity to be quite dark. But in fact, if you look at the subtitle, it's surviving the Titanic. And a lot of it is about the survival aspect of it. So it, it's not actually as bleak as you as you think it's going to be. Uh, but the first the first poem in the in the book is neither bleak nor uh, joyful. It's just a set up poem. And it's a mirror sonnet, which means that it's two sonnets that read upwards and downwards. OK, and not a lot of people know everything in this book, by the way, about the Titanic is true. Not a lot of people know that there were actually two sister ships. There was the Olympic and the Titanic and the only that has had the Titanic sunk. So this is about that. It's called Sister Ships. What an experience traveling on the Olympic. She is the flagship of the White Star Line. Compared to other ships, she looks gigantic. The epitome of luxury in design. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Many passengers are prominent in high society. She is a jewel. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich. It isn't quite so comfy in third class. And if by chance the voyage hits a glitch, an iceberg say, nothing will come to pass. She is unsinkable, no need to fear. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. Look at her waiting at Southampton Pier. She is unsinkable. No need to fear an iceberg, say. Nothing will come to pass, even if the voyage should hit a glitch. It may not be so comfy in third class. This is a truly marvelous time to be rich in high society. She is a jewel. Many passengers are prominent. She has a Turkish bath, a swimming pool. Her first class cabins are spacious and opulent, the epitome of luxury and design. Compared to other ships, she is gigantic the perfect flagship of the White Star Line. What an experience traveling on the Titanic. And that was Sister Ships from yes. Under Dark Water, Surviving the Titanic. Um, and Anna, you already mentioned the two things that really stand out in this book, which I think is just an amazing book. Um, the, the first of them is just the detail. Like, there's so many things I didn't know. And I Googled a few things just like, is she making stuff up? Because they're fascinating details. The, the, the story about the Titan, I don't know if you're going to read that poem, but the, the oh, book. Oh, yeah, I can that. Like, yeah, yeah. What? Oh, my gosh. So, um, so that was fascinating, just all the detail and research that went into this. Um, yeah. But then um, this book has the biggest turn of any book I've ever read. Because the first two thirds, maybe almost, or maybe over half at least, um, is factual, you know, sonnets and things about the Titanic, um, and then it takes this turn with one line where all of a sudden your mother appears, and you realize the whole book is a metaphor for for going through your mother's death, and then the at the end of the book is so emotionally powerful and so different from the beginning. Um, I didn't even know. It's weird to even talk about. It. I didn't want to spoil it for anybody, but since you brought it up, we could. Um, but but how did the the book come to be? Um, how did you know that these two topics were merged together? It was just such a. I've never seen a bigger turn in a book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like to surprise. Uh, so what happened was my mother died in April, and uh, it was a very sudden illness. Uh, she was ill for about four weeks, and then she she passed away. And I wrote some Nija poems in reaction to that, which I'm not sure if they're poems or primal screams. I mean, um, when you lose your mother, whatever uh, age that happens at, it's it's very, very raw experience. And then what actually happened is that a year later, so now we're talking the next April, uh, my newsfeed filled up with stories about the Titanic, because of course the Titanic sank in April. And it suddenly hit me that my mother's death was very much like the iceberg. And I was like the Titanic, you know, sailing along quite happily, nothing wrong, hit the iceberg, my mother gets sick, think everything's gonna be okay. And gradually it dawns on you that things are not going to be okay. And it occurred to me that this would be a really interesting way to try and look at my mother's death 
with a little bit more uh, objectivity, although you're right, the second half is not particularly objective, but I was able to work through some of the feelings that I had. And I, there are some very subtle mirrorings between the mm -hmm. poems that are about the Titanic and the poems that are about my mother's death, which you may have to <laughs> read it a couple of times to pick up on. Yeah, um, and, and it sort of culminates with an amazing heroic crown of sonnets. And that's a, mm -hmm. that's the literally, I think, the most difficult thing for any poet to do, the heroic crown, which is where each um, the last line of each sonnet becomes the first line of the next sonnet. You do yeah. 14 of those a row, and then the 15th sonnet has to be all the lines that were repeated making its own sonnet, um, which is just a mind-boggling um, thing to do and this was the and it merges the two together so you go kind of go back and forth and you really it really hones the focus of um <laughs> of the way that these two things are parallel and merged together sort of psychologically i guess you could say and um so, so can I that, blow your mind just a little what's that can i blow your mind just a little go bit? ahead yeah <laughs> i love being blown i wrote that poem in a day oh my gosh that it really is yeah <laughs> um i was at the virginia center for the creative arts shout out to them uh, so I didn't have anything else to do apart from writing and the thing about a heroic crown of sonnets is it has momentum mm -hmm. because the last line of every sonnet is the first line of the next sonnet so you've already started the next poem by the time you finish the first one and that is actually a very difficult thing to walk away from I have to say I literally just wrote my second heroic crown of sonnets and it took me a week so but i'm not at the virginia wow. center for the creative arts right now so that would, that would be the explanation that, that is just that is amazing i really i mean that's hard to believe um because it's so i mean it's so it seemed like so much work um and my question was just going to be if the if the um sonnet the crown came first and then you wrote the book around it or did you like know to cap it with that uh well therein lies another tale and i know you know the late great kim bridgeford mm -hmm who I think was on this um, this very podcast a couple of years ago. And uh, so I'm at the Virginia Center of the Creative Arts working on this manuscript. I'd written a bunch of the Titanic poems and then, and I'd sent them to Kim because she was, at the time, she was one of my first readers. I liked her to read my, my work. And she emailed me back and she said, Anna, I think this book could use a heroic crown of sonnet. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> I've never written one of those, Kim. I'm not sure I can do that. And she goes, oh, come on. I know you, you're capable. You're more than capable. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it, was, it wasn't the last poem I, read, I wrote, but it was by a long way not the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in Rattle we published two. We did one by Patricia Smith, Motown Crown, and then there's one by, by Kim. Um, yeah. And I can't yes. remember the name of that. It's about a, um, I don't know, just look, look, up, uh, look up Kim Bridgeford and Crown and you'll find it. Isn't it a crown for Ted and uh, Isn't that what, oh, the blue whale. The okay. blue whale. That's what it is. The blue whale, which is a strange, strange story of um, a suicide game actually online. Oh, yes. I've read it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you, you can check those out for more. I can send you, I can send you my, my, my second crown of sonnets. If for sure. Like, yeah. Like yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. And everybody is just sure their mind's blown just seeing one once they realize yeah. what it's doing. <laughs> you, you can't, it's not, they're not very good poems to read in a, mm -hmm. in a setting like this though, because they just take too much concentration. They're better to be absorbed on your own, I think. Yeah, I agree. I wouldn't want you to read it now. It's just something, it's a reason for people to go buy the book. So go buy the book. Yeah, yeah. go buy the book. Read the, the, the book. crown. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, it was just, I think the uh, Patricia Smith reads hers, I think on our website and it's like 15 minutes of of just oh, yeah. nothing least, but reading. At so. least 10 minutes, 12 minutes, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, anyway, let's hear another poem. I want to wanna okay. keep, keep the poems rolling. Well, you mentioned the one about the, uh, the Titan. And so when I started to do research for this book, I found out all of these interesting stories about the Titanic. And this was one of them. And it's true. Everything in this book is true. Yeah. There's um, so much out there. Can you, I forgot uh, to tell you before the show, can you tell me the page number so I can show it? Oh, sorry. This is on page eight. Okay, great. Thanks. So the, the actual truth is that, and this is the epigraph, so this explains it best. The Titan and its sinking have been noted to be very similar to the real life passenger ship RMS Titanic, which sank 14 years later. Somebody, an author called Morgan Robertson, wrote a novel about the fictional sinking of a, an ocean liner called the Titan by an iceberg 14 years before the Titanic sank. Blows your mind. I know. So, this is, and you, you know I love a persona poem. So a lot of the, the sonnets in this book are persona poems, which means they're in the first person, but they are not me. 
So I, I drop myself into all of these characters in, in the book, and this is one of them. It's, it's, a, it's a second class passenger. So this is called a second class lady passenger. Futility or the wreck of the Titan. The first class ladies have their reading room. We have the library. That's where I repair after dinner. My husband, I assume, is smoking with the other men. The chair I like is snug and in a well-lit nook. I finished Ethan Frome the other night. Today, I found the most unsettling book by Morgan Robertson. It tells the plight of an ocean liner just like the Titanic, except it hits an iceberg and then sinks. Imagine how the passengers all panic. I had to ask my husband what he thinks. He said, I shouldn't worry my pretty head. It's only fiction. No one's really dead. What a chilling, chilling poem and uh, a great, great imagination to put that in the first person like that. Um, oh, but that, you know, I, I love I love first. But I'm not going to read from this, but, you know, I have sisters and courtesans, which is all first person sonnets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. good. First yeah, person. I mean, that's just I, I mean, I had no idea. I, I can't believe Morris not made of that, that. There was a book about the Titanic disaster 14 years Did before. You Google the, that one. Yeah, Did you Google that that's part? the you one did. I Googled. I was like, is that <laughs> is she making that up? I mean, it, it just goes back to the, the night alchemy, the night that the web photos mm -hmm. came out. Like, there is something more to the universe. And I think it's what poetry taps into, actually. There's some yeah, magic definitely. mystery, you know, some kind of associative collective conscience thing that's like projecting reality not to get too you know mystical but but that is that was a, a strange thing that I'm, I'm surprised i never heard before um yeah and it was called the titan too i mean you can't get i mean wow mm -hmm. um yeah so so let's uh let's let's step back a little bit and talk about just how you got into poetry how did you become a poet and why do you think you're drawn to formal poetry in particular okay that's a good question um so my father would be the reason that I got drawn to poetry. He was a great declaimer of verse. Um, so I grew up in a household where my father would literally recite Shakespeare or Hopkins or T.S. Eliot or who else did he love? Larkin. Uh, and he would do this in the kitchen as he and I were preparing meals. And it sort of just imbued me with this, um, this sense that poetry was something that you could do. And I, I did it all my life. I started, I have a, a literal book, but I could, I'm not going to get it, but it, I have a book, a collected book of my handwritten poems from when I was 11 on. And many of them are formal. Mm -hmm. I did go through a teenage angsty period when I was really into Sylvia Plath, when I was mostly writing free verse, ink black soul type free verse. Um, but I came back, I came back to, uh, to, to form. I, I think the other thing that um, caused me to be attracted to form is that um, although I'm not particularly religious, I grew up in the Church of England and my um, primary school or elementary school, if you want to call it that, was a uh, Church of England school. So we spent a lot of time in the church and we sang a lot of hymns. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like getting the uh, iambic pentameter and iambic tetrameter or the 4343 three of the ballad stanza into your brain like a good collection of English hymns. Oh, very good. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, it's something I never really thought about much until we talked to um, Janice and Harrington about that on her episode not too long ago, but just the amount. And, and, and she was even wondering if it was the, um, the lack of church going that sort of has decreased the popularity of poetry because we haven't had as much um, exposure to just that, that sense of meter and that sense of what poetry is through, through um, things like the Psalms. Right, right. I, and I also think that there was a very conscious break in this country away from writing formal poetry and was sort of a deliberate, we're not going to be like them. We're not going to be like those fuddy-duddy British people. We're going to write in free verse. And um, I can't tell you how many times, you are amazing. You're a great supporter of formal poetry. I've lost count of how many of my poems you've published, but um, I have been accused of being old fashioned, of forced rhyme. Um, you know, I, all of these things make me cringe because I don't think there's anything old fashioned about my poetry. And I certainly wouldn't be caught dead with a forced rhyme. <laughs> of course not. Yeah, it's just always, I, I just wish personally that it wouldn't be, like, everything just has to break into camps and tribes, you know? And, and there's some people um, who, who say, oh, God, a rhyming poem, get it away from me. <laughs> and then there's right. some people who say it's not a poem unless it rhymes. I mean, those, those two emails I get almost daily. Um, I get Neither that. of these are true. Neither yeah, of these are yeah. true. But I, I do love a poem with structure. 
and free verse poems can have structure too, you know? And, and it, actually I've written several free verse poems that have structure, uh, but I do like something that holds the poem together. Not all of my formal poems rhyme. I mean, um, would you like me to read the Abbasidarian? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. I love the Abbasidarian. <laughs> right, for anyone who doesn't know what an Abbasidarian is, it is a poem where every line begins with the letter of the alphabet consecutively. And it gets very tricky at the end because of course X, Y, Z is the last three letters of the alphabet, but you'll see what I did about that. And this is another one that is completely true and it's on page 22. Thank you. It's called Animals of the Titanic. Astor's Airedale Kitty perished along with her owner. Then Captain Smith's Irish Wolfhound put ashore in Southampton. Chow Chow, left behind by Harry Anderson, drowned. Dog, a fox terrier, last seen swimming. English foxhounds, 100, booked an alternate passage. Fru Fru, detached from her grip on Helen Bishop's gown, perished. Gamine de Picon, prize-winning French bulldog, drowned. Hens and roosters, caged, drowned. Isham, Anne Elizabeth, and her Great Dane, bodies recovered together. Jenny, ship's mouser, drowned. Kittens of Jenny, likewise. Lady, Pomeranian of first-class passenger Margaret Hayes, survived. Mice and rats, free living, drowned. Newfoundland, Rigel, survivor and hero, apocryphal. Objections raised to the three dogs on the lifeboats, none. Pomeranian, belonging to Elizabeth Rothschild, survived. Quote, I refuse to get on the lifeboat without my dog. Rothschild Martin, body never recovered. Sun Yat-sen, Pekingese of Henry Sleeper Harper, survived. Terrier and Spaniel of the Philadelphia Carters perished. Unconscionable. The 56 children left out of the lifeboats. Vacancies on the lifeboats, 40%. Wealthy survivors, 200 plus three dogs. And X, Y, Z, and X, Y, Z, and X, Y, Z. Yeah, very See clever at the end. Yeah, that was Animals <laughs> of the Titanic, one of two list poems in the in the issue yes. in the book yes. too. Um, Again, list poem. It's not. It's not. It's not a rhyming poem. Mm -hmm. it, it has. It has a structure. It has an ethos. You know, it has a driving principle, but it isn't a rhyming poem. Do you find uh, that that it's the the form that draws you through the poem? Like, if, is it hard? You know. You know, with, with a list poem like that, you have a guideline. With a sonnet, you have a guideline. Like, the, there's a way that the form and and you know gives you something like a rope to hold on to almost. As you're like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe mm -hmm. like as a you know cave scuba diver or something. It's a it's a rope to to where you got to get to. Um, do you find that, that that's really important for generating the the content of your poems? Uh, I, I think it's a synergistic process. So um, I try really hard to make the content fit the form and the form fit the content. And when you have repetition, which many um, received forms do, such as the Villanelle, it's super important that that's meaningful and it's not something that you're imposing on the poem. Every time you repeat a line, it needs to get more impactful. I mean, the, the um, ideal, the perfect poem, the perfect villanelle is Elizabeth Bishop's one art, mm -hmm. right? The art of losing isn't hard to master, right? And as she goes through the poem, every time she repeats that line, the loss has gotten deeper and harder, right? That's what you need to do with, with repetition. It can't, it, it, you need to avoid anticlimax in the same way with a sestina, right? Sestinas, uh, suffer from a lot of problems um, because you have to repeat the same six words in six stanzas. And then at the end, you have to have two lines with three words in each of the line. And um, Sistinas have a tendency to become a kind of circular argument where you're just going around and saying the same things again and again and again, because you've got to use the same words. And um, there's a Sestina in this book, which is, um, what's it called? Uh, the Lord's Prayer on Collapsible B. And so what I did with this sestina is I, first of all, the six words, the six repetends are all words from the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. 
which you may or not have noticed again. Do, there's, a, yeah. things like that, there's a few things like that. And I very much wanted it to be a narrative poem about the experience of the people who were on this lifeboat. And so there, there's, there needs to be a momentum driving us, Estina, forward so that you don't repeat yourself. You have to have an idea of where you're going. I'm not sure if I answered the question there or not. No, I think it does. It's great to think of it as a, as a synergy between the two and everything, you know, it's, it's convergent, you know, emergent properties of things. I think you probably should read that Sestina now that you... Um... I would love to read the Sestina. Okay. It's a little long, but I would be very happy to read the Sestina. I am very proud of it. Um, it Sestinas are not, and it's on page 20. Sestinas are not easy, as I say. They, they suffer from that problem that I already talked about. And the other problem they suffer from is Sestina drift. So as you go through the poem, the lines get longer and longer and longer as you try and find more inventive ways to use the word. That's really funny um, that there's a there's a word for that because I've noticed that in submissions. I mean, it's yeah, one of the things that stands yeah. out. You can see, you can almost see without even seeing the end words that it's a system. Yeah, like it's <laughs> yeah. um, I, I sort of bypass that by typically writing my sustainers in loose iambic pentameter. They're not as hard as, you know, my sonnets, but they are. It, they're, they're constrained by that. The Lord's Prayer on Collapsible B, and it's worth saying that Collapsible B was one of the lifeboats that went out, but it went out upside down. It wasn't put together. Oh. So it was, it was floating, but it wasn't actually a boat. Someone said, don't you think we ought to pray? And so we went around and each man named the religion that he followed here on earth. I'm a Presbyterian like my father, but I'd have prayed to any God to deliver us right then and after sought forgiveness. When facing death, men need to feel forgiven and even the ungodly turn to prayer. On the upturned boat, we had scant hope of delivery. I thought of my wife and children whispered their names. And then we agreed we should all say the Our Father and hope for a better place beyond this earth. My God, I yearned to be back on solid earth more than I wanted my many sins forgiven. I wanted to hear my young son call out Father and gather my family together in simple prayer. Still, one man there, I do not know his name, took a deep breath and commenced at once to deliver the Lord's prayer, the one that prays for him to deliver us from evil, that his will be done on earth. I almost laughed. Do you think this happened in his name? Some sinner perhaps on the ship he couldn't forgive? Anyway, I mumbled the well-known prayer. All of us shivering repeated the Our Father. A young boy whimpered that he had lost his father. The screams of the drowning faded beyond deliverance, and still a dozen or more of us said the prayer known since childhood to so many people on earth. Forgive us, I said to the dying, please forgive me as I forgive you, and mentioned people by name. Finally, a whistle and a dark shape asking to name who was in charge. I said the name of my father uneasily, aware that there could be no forgiveness, even if by some miracle we were delivered. I knew I'd spend the rest of my days on earth thinking of those who did not have a prayer nor would I ever name my most honest prayer. Our Father, for our hubris on this earth, forgive your children and, O Lord, deliver us. That was the Lord's Prayer on Collapsible B. And again, we're reading poems from uh, Under Dark Water, Surviving the Titanic by Anna M. Evans, just to reset. Um, and, and I just love the, the way that Sestina moves. It, because the narrative sort of conversational voice like draws it through where the form, the, you know, the repetitive words kind of are surprising mm -hmm. and you kind of almost forget that it's Sestina and then they, it keeps pulling you back in. There's a really cool effect like that. It's a persona Sestina, of course, as well. So it's in the <laughs> voice of the young lieutenant who's on the boat. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, the other thing that you need to be prepared to do with Sestinas is to mess with the repetent. So it's not always forgiveness. Sometimes it's forgiven, you know, that way you can avoid some of the pitfalls of over repetition. Um, while we're talking about the way, way poems are generated, there were a few questions um, about the poems you read early on. Um, um, Dick Westheimer wanted to know about the, the heroic, heroic uh, crown. If you do, mm -hmm. the, do you do the last poem first or yeah. um, and someone else on Facebook had a similar question about um okay. about the, so, the mirror the mirror one like did you do oh. one one um sonnet and then think oh this could be a mirror and then you worked it into a mirror or did you know it was gonna be a mirror ahead of time like how how preconceived okay. versus how organic are these forms well so this the sister ships one was totally preconceived because as I said earlier you have to make the content match the form and for me the mirror sonnet just went so totally hand in hand with the concept of sister ships. These ships were practically identical. There's no reason why the Titanic sank and the Olympic didn't. They were designed the same way. Of course, after the Titanic sank, they made modifications to the Olympic. 
Um, so it, it, that one was definitely, uh, it, 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 I, I constructed it to do that. And what you do is you write the first line and then you are aware that that is going to be the last line of the second sonnet. So you also write it as the second. I usually use X's. So I write first line and then X, 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 and then second sonnet, X, 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 last line. And you keep doing that. And of course it's, it's an iterative process. You have to keep going forward and back does this what line work here? Can I mix? Can I change it up a bit? Of course, it helps if the lines don't have to repeat exactly. Most of those do, but not all of them do. But it's very much an iterative process. And yes, I was working on both of the sonnets at the same time. Mm. Now, fast forward to the heroic crown. My first heroic crown, Kim, telling me I had to write one, started writing it. I'm like, oh, this is good. This is going well. And then I suddenly realized that I had to do the thing <laughs> with the 15th sonnet. And um, Again, if you go and look at it very carefully, you can see that I've fudged it a bit. I've fudged it. Not all of the, not all of the lines rhyme and I actually switched some of them around. Um, I have this thing about form though. I'm sure you agree because you've seen formal poems. Uh, form isn't a straight jacket. Mm -hmm. It's always okay to modify a form. I think Mara said this when we were talking about her pontoon. So long as you can recognize the principles that generated the poem, you don't have to stick by the strict uh, analysis of what that form should be. So the first heroic crime was a little bit of a fudge. I just wrote, I wrote a bunch of sonnets, realized I then had to do the 15th sonnet, sort of retroactively um, designed it to work. Now, second crown of sonnets, very clever. I actually knew that ahead of time. So I just created a framework again with X's and then this last line needs to be rhymed with this. And, and then I fill it in as I was going through when every time I finished a last line, I put it in the 15th sonnet. So I knew where it was going. But then I did write the last line of the 15th sonnet before I wrote the last line of the 14th sonnet, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. That was important. Mm -hmm. The last line of a poem is the most important line. Mm -hmm. So that, that had to be right. I'm gonna have to send you this poem now, yeah. Yeah, I definitely wanna read it. Yeah, for sure. Um, but it's so fascinating. So, the, so do, knowing, knowing what you had to do ahead of time made it take seven times as long, apparently. No, yeah. the fact that I was trying to live a normal life rather than <laughs> an artist to yeah. treat made it take seven times as long. <laughs> um, well, let's read another poem. Um, I think we should probably, do you, do you have any poems later in the book to share so we, so we can get a sense of oh, that yeah. turn into the, the we, more personal? We should, we should read um, some of the later poems because it does it does change quite a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. The, the last poem in the uh, Titanic section is the one where it turns. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read that one? Yeah, that's a great one to show. I mean, this it, it, the the experience of um, you know, the, I don't. Know, I wish we could just recreate that experience because it's so strange. You're like the, my mother, what? And then you, and then the book yeah. moves on, and then you understand yeah. why the mother's appearing. But it's such a, yeah. it's a great turn. But, yeah, but imagine okay. that you have no idea the mother's coming up because I didn't. No, and no, there's no, no. There's no hint of it. You're buying a book you... about the Titanic yeah, and you exactly, are, but, exactly. but the mother is coming. I, I, and this also has an epigraph and I think I can manage to sing it. Um, it's actually from a child's nursery rhyme. Uh, so it's called The Meditation on Loss and the epigraph is, Oh, they built the ship Titanic to sail the ocean blue for they thought it was a ship that the water would never go through. It was on its maiden trip that an iceberg hit the ship it was sad when the great ship went down. You know that one? I don't, no. Okay. When death arrives on such a monstrous scale, it feels unreal, which is, of course, made worse by all the ways that we retell the tale in stories, movies, songs, and even verse. Add to this how strange that world can sound with its rigid social structure and quaint clothes, a moral fable, 1,500 drowned through arrogance. The fact is no one knows quite how we measure loss. It's not by lives. Thousands die daily. Diseases, famine, war. Is it the grief of the person who survives that makes a single loss hard to ignore? These deaths don't move me more than any other. But every day I live, I miss my mother. Yeah, there was a meditation on loss, the kind of turn point. Oh, sorry, that's on page 36. Yeah. Oh, I have it, yeah. You had it, you found it. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you want to do another one just to... Uh... Yes, yes. Um, so this is a guzzle. And so this is another one that is uh, not, well, there is rhyme in it, but it isn't a conventional end rhyme thing. You know, guzzle is like in couplets, the rhyme comes before the last few syllables of the line. But this kind of speaks to the thing I said in the beginning about how my mother died in April and then the Titanic uh, memorabilia came up in April. Titanic month, this is page 47. 
I flew 3,000 miles to be by her side in April, but found out there was nowhere I could hide in April. I thought to make things right by force of will, to celebrate her 51 years of bride in April. I hugged her, read to her, fed her, even changed her. Please understand, God knows I really tried in April. Nurses scurried about, the machines beeped alarmingly, and still the doctors lied in April. Each night I left the hospital, the stars were witnesses to all the tears I cried in April. No deals to make, no good choices, no prayers. No wonder then that I was terrified in April. Titanic month, as pitiless as ice, to all the souls she's drowned. My mother died in April. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking poem, the Titanic month. And um, and that's just the, the turn that it makes, though, into such, such um, you know, just real emotion. Um, and that's, it makes it a beautiful, I mean, it was a fascinating book in the first half. And then once you realize what it's about uh, more deeply, it just expands onto like every, you know, hitting on all cylinders type of, uh, type of book. It's really impressive. Um, yeah. how, how long did it take you, you know, to, to write and get this book published out? Um, was it something that, oh, um, um, so I wrote it, let me see. Um, I wrote it, I think in the, I was at the VCCA the summer of 2016. I think my mother died in April, 2015. I had started messing with the idea around about April, 2015, 2016 rather, but um, then I needed to get into my sort of zone mm -hmm. to actually be able to focus on it. So most of the books were completed by the time I'd done my three week residency at the VCCA, the summer of 2016. And then I entered it into the Able Muse <laughs> contest um, and it didn't win. Oh, really? I'm surprised. I, what, what no. could, I mean, I don't want to <laughs> say what, what could have beaten it, but, but what could have I can't remember who, who, who won. <laughs> um, but Alex often publishes a couple or three of the manuscripts that actually uh, he that make it to the final cut. Mm -hmm. And it was actually quite interesting. And this is a segue. If you want to take the segue, I found out on the day after election day 2017 that he was offering to publish this poem mm. this manuscript and i was it was interesting because i'd just gone through another gutting loss yeah mm -hmm. um and uh then i opened my email and it, there it was the offer to publish the book and i was like oh well it, it, it's i think what enables me to continue in my life as a hopeless democratic politician in a republican town uh is that it's not the only thing i do you mm -hmm. know so having poetry teaching my family to give me meaning outside of struggling to do a thing which is probably impossible mm -hmm. actually helps well, let's let's take that segue if you don't mind. Um, so, so you've gotten into and after the the point that I first met you, we started publishing. You took a turn and became. Um, and what is it that you are? What's your office that you? Oh, I'm only the township chair of the uh -huh. Democratic Party, Hainesport Township Democratic Chair. But mm -hmm. I've also kept. I've run for office now four times for the township committee and lost every time. I'm running right now. Yeah. So, so this coming up of election in the fall. Yes. So, so what was it that, that made you get involved locally? Um, was there some kind of, you know, inciting incident that, that made you become more involved? Because that's a, I mean, um, I can't imagine. I mean, I know the local chairs of things that we do. It's a lot of work. And um, yeah, it is a lot of work. I mean, um, yeah, I, what happened was that there was some glaring corruption in the township committee, um, which needed to be addressed. And so when I ran for the first, first time in 2016, I was running to address that corruption. And um, the corruption did get addressed, but unfortunately not by me winning the election. Uh -huh. And not all of it did. So, you know, it's a, I don't want to talk about the ramifications oh, for of sure, yeah. politics, but like, I'm still trying to address corruption and lack of representation and lack of transparency. Because the problem is that my town has been Republican now for uh, 30 years. And uh, to be honest, it's not about Republican. It's if either party has a monopoly on power in any particular locality mm -hmm. for that level, that period of time, they just have a lock on things and nobody really knows what's going on and they get to do what they want. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the problem in a nutshell. With the two parties, you know, you can you can become like that. Um, so, so what how, what does that have to do with poetry? Like, like, do you think there's a similar a similar thing that drew, draws you to both to, to acting in in the way that you are and, and taking initiative? Uh, that's a really good question, Tim. Um, I think that I am uh, a very honest person who believes passionately in fairness, Mm -hmm. in things being fair. And poetry gives me an opportunity to do that, to to be honest and also to address perceived inequalities or uh, things that uh, I don't think are going right. I will always speak out when I think things aren't going right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyone who knows me, I don't know (laughs) how many people are watching this. (laughs) Anyone who knows me knows that I will always speak out when things are not right. And um, poetry enables me to do that in a more subtle way. Um, Politics is a little bit more of a blunt instrument. Yeah. um, And and your poems have taken, I think, uh, or at least between these two books, the more recent one takes a much more political turn. I've read some political poems online of yours, which we have uh, The Arm Teacher, if you want to read that at some point. Oh, yes, I'd love to read The Arm Teacher, especially given recent developments in um, gun control. Uh, So this is actually from my book, uh, The Unacknowledged Legislator, which is, of course, a quote from um, Shelley. uh, Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And of course, I have never been elected to office, so I cannot legislate, but I can write poems about things that could be legislated. So you have this from when it was published by Newverse News, I yeah, think. Yeah, we have the Newverse um, News version. This came about because uh, after what, I can't even remember which gun massacre it was, Parkland maybe, there was this like cockamamie idea that like the best way to stop school shortings was to arm teachers. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> have you seen me with a gun? So this is the armed teacher. I own an arsenal of ways to think and choose the weapon just as I see fit. I'm packing color markers and red ink. My PowerPoints are reinforced with wit. I used a Glock once at a rifle range, but even muffled couldn't stand the sound. I wasn't a bad shot, but it was strange the way the target swung with every round. Sometimes I think, what if it happened here? I'd lock the door, of course, I know the drill. But every day we need to fight the fear and fear's not something you can shoot to kill. So you can keep your bullets, guns and knives. I'm armed with words and working to save lives. Yeah, excellent. And that was, uh, again, from Newverse News, um, a kind of a poet respond. Um, I, want, I don't want to say a poet respond alternative, but another place you can send your poet respond yeah. poems. It's newversenews.blogspot.com. And that was from Sunday, February 25th. They publish more poems than, than we do on Poetry Spawn, which is nice. So you can, I think they do one almost every day or maybe even mm-hmm. every day. Um, but but yeah. so, so how do you feel, what do you think poetry's place in politics is? Do you think poems can be effective political tools? Um, or, do yeah. you think it's, or do you think it's more about, you know, coming to terms with your own p- p- opinions? Uh, do, do you think, and how do you see poetry fitting in? Because poems have gotten so much more political. When we started Poets Respond, I think it was 2014, it was pretty rare to get submissions of poems, um, you know, and then everything's kind of changed and everything's become a lot more political and just regular uh, submissions are full of politics as well now. Um, so what do you think poetry's place is within the political? Well, well first of all, I think poetry has always been political. Um, if, if you look at the poetry um, of the civil rights movement, for example, um, there's no way you can say that's not political. Uh, I think that this country has got just incredibly polarized and it's not getting any better. Uh, I hoped that the four year Trump presidency would end and that we would come back together, but that didn't happen. And of course, the latest thing with the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade is only making it worse. Um, So yeah, I, I think poetry has a role there. I mean, people need to write poems about those things. When you are outraged, you need to write poems mm-hmm. and you need to publish them in places like Poets Respond or Newverse News so that people can read them and feel your outrage. I mean, poetry is, for me, it, it, it can do two, well, this, it, this is oversimplification, but there are two things it can do really well. It, it can deliver an experience that the reader has not had and make them feel it, or it can deliver an experience that the reader has had and make them relive it. 
And both of those things are incredibly important for political poetry, right? Because you, you need to keep the momentum, the outrage going, mm-hmm. right? You can't just go, oh, well, that happened and there's nothing we can do about that. No, no, come on, there is. You know, read this poem, share this poem, and then go vote. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, so what is, um, what is your experience, um, you know, running for an office somewhere while being a poet? Uh, we published, um, anonymous member of the U S Congress once, if you look back at our oh. poems and I can't say who it was, I won't even say the, you know, the gender of who it was so as not to tip the, the hat, you know, they, uh, they, they had this poem and they sent it to us and didn't want to say, you know, we, we, we said we publish it. And then they said, Oh, you know what? I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> to, just to be and it wasn't because of what the poem said it was just because being known as a poet was like campaign fodder and and they didn't oh, want yeah. to um you know be mocked as a poet like you know, yes. you know doodling on the side um, that has and, happened to me yeah yeah mm-hmm. so, so what is your experience that's happened to you oh yeah 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 oh yeah um the very first Actually, this is when I met you in LA. Uh, the very first time I ran, um, they ran a smear mailer against me and the tagline was taxpayer funded trips to sunny Los Angeles. <laughs> um, background, you know, mailers lie, right? Um, I was working at Stockton University at the time. They gave me a grant of $500 to travel to LA to represent the university. Didn't cover my plane ticket and my hotel. Mm-hmm but they gave me a little grant. So taxpayer funded trips to sunny Los Angeles. So that was funny, not. Um, and then 2017, they, the different set of Republicans reiterated that with, went to LA to peddle a book she wrote. Peddle, <laughs> peddle a book she wrote. Uh-huh. And then just this past year when I was running, now, I mean, I write, I mean, if, as you're a writer, you, you, you're not necessarily confined to just one thing. You, I write poetry, but I've also written a few short stories, not very many. Um, nonfiction essays, I, great line in letters to the editor, mm-hmm. right? Also blog, and the blog can be very political. So that was a target to write some blog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think that has any traction? I mean, I was just, I don't know. I think people would like to know that this this member of Congress was writing a, a poem. And, and what it's about is very sort of heartfelt and, and right. interesting to hear that perspective uh, in the way poetry is, you know, I think... I think people would, I think um, that person's constituents would probably appreciate it, at least the ones that vote for him or her. I, I think, I think basically there are too many lawyers in politics mm-hmm. and not enough artists and teachers. Um, I also think there are not enough women. Mm-hmm. Um, but if there were more people who feel like I do, you know, that inequality is a huge problem and we need to address that, right? Unfairness, inequality. These are things we need to address. And that's, that that's the mentality of a writer I think in many ways you know that that's how we we work through these issues is by writing poems or essays about these things and not doing it for our own benefit because let's face it Mm -hmm. there's no money in poetry I am not rich (laughs) (laughs) for my six books Mm -hmm. um but so we don't do it for the money right and it, it seems to me that a lot of the people who are in politics are in it for the power or the money, right? Once you've been humbled by a few rejections, you you you, you know, you have to keep going and it's not about the glory. It, it, it's about the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I was thinking about that because, you know, writing is so much rejection. And, and I was reading, I saw a meme, it was just a meme recently about Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if you've seen that meme online, but but all of his failures, like, you know, it was like, you know, mother died at eight, you know, failed business at 18, went bankrupt, went to a mental institution, you know, didn't get out of bed for a year, ran for Congress and lost, another bankruptcy, ran for this and lost, and then eventually became president and, you know, one of the greatest presidents of all time. So there's this sense of, like, re- rejection that's part of it, too, and, and keeping up mm-hmm. the fight no matter what, which is um, right. a great thing for a politician to have and a necessary thing for a poet to have, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, like... um, being rejected as a poet many times definitely helped me lose elections <laughs> yeah. or helped me deal with losing elections. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the next, uh, the next book, the more recent one is the Quarantina right. Chronicles, which have yeah. a lot more political poems in them. Um, yeah. Do you want to just introduce what's going on in this book so we can, yeah. uh, I'll show it right. up on screen, but this is the Quarantina so, Chronicles just by the sound of it. You can probably tell what it's about maybe. 
So this was my April 2020 project. So by the time we got to April 2020, we were in total lockdown in New Jersey. I don't know how it was in LA, um, but I literally didn't leave the house for a month. Um, and of course, April is National Poetry Month, so it seemed like a good thing to actually do that. I don't always do the poem a day thing, but I thought, well, what, what else am I doing? I'm teaching, but that's not that many hours a week. Um, let's do the poem a day. But I wanted, again, generative principles. I wanted to have one. So the generative principle for the Quarantina Chron Chronicles is that um, every day in April, I found an article online I, that was interesting to me. I, gener I copied and pasted the article into one of those word cloud generators online. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at which the most common words were. Now, I'd be lying if I said I always picked the three most common words because if I had done that, every poem would have had Trump in it. And I didn't want to do that. So, but I picked three of the most common words in each of the articles. And then I created a tritina which is sort of mini Sestina with only three repetends for that article for every day of April. And so the whole thing is sort of a record of what April was like. And then the last poem in the book is a Sestina. And I generated that by taking the entire manuscript and dumping it into a word cloud and picking the top six words, one of which is Trump, mm -hmm. of course, and creating a Sestina using that. So that's the principle behind it. And, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's, they're my best poems, but as a book, it's, it holds together really well. I mean, it, it, it's very, uh, it's a record. And that's another thing that poetry can do really well. It can be a record, a social record of what's going on at a particular time. And this is a social record of April, 2020 for me. Yeah. Yeah. The title says it all, the Quarantina Chronicles, which is a yes. great way to put it. Do you want Did to, you want me to... A, yeah. Do you want to read one of them? Yes. Um, I have picked a couple that I could read. Uh, and again, they're tritinas, so they're just 10 lines each. And each of them is uh, has an epigraph, which is the title of the original article. So the, this is page 14. The first thing people will struggle to pay is rent. And the epigraph is, what to do if you can't pay rent because of coronavirus job loss? And that was from the Huffington Post on the 3rd of April, 2020. The first thing people will struggle to pay is rent. And there aren't many national protections for tenants against the obvious threat of eviction. Landlords have mortgages due, so eviction is their way of securing those payments, though rent, through rent, even if they genuinely like their tenants. Families can refuse to leave, become squatting tenants, use the virus as a shield against eviction. The irony is that the virus doesn't pay rent as it rents our lungs, a bad tenant, hard to evict. It's the first thing people will struggle to pay is rent from the Quarantina Chronicles. Um, yeah. If anybody has any questions, there's there's not tons of time left, but if you have any questions, I will still pass them along. There's a little bit of time. Um, so leave them in the chat windows on YouTube or Facebook. Um, you can't, I'm not looking at Twitter, so don't leave them there. Um, but I'm happy to pass along any other uh, any other questions. Um, but let's hear another poem from the Quarantine. You said you wanted to read yeah. a couple. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. There's a couple that I, I think um, have stood the test of time. Uh this one is um, social distancing means all students are now in online school. And I think we're, we're only just now coming to terms with what, what the, the negative impact mm -hmm. of online school on our, at two years worth of, of children. Uh, so this is from um, a Wired article, the 6th of April, the reality of COVID-19 is hitting teens especially hard. Social distancing means all students are now in online school. Parents, teachers, grade schoolers, and of course, teens have to make sacrifices. But who's having the hardest time? Work from home parents now have to find the time to supervise lessons for kids who are bored in school. But the students are always on their phones. The high school teens suddenly see that they're missing out on their teens. Palms, graduation, sports seasons, all lost in time. Sammy, 17 and bored says she just wants to go to school. The loss of school for teens is their 9-11 crisis time. Oh, and Sammy was a real person who's a daughter of one of my friends. You mentioned uh, teaching. Do you teach um, in, in uh, what, what school do you teach at? Is it uh... Uh, Right, I teach community college. Oh, okay. I teach mm -hmm. at, um, Rowan um, 
County at, I'm sorry, Rowan College at Burlington County, which is our local community college. I teach English 101, English 102, <laughs> uh, and English 080. Um, it, so. It's been a while since we've had a teacher on, actually. How, how are things, are people like getting back to normal, or is it still the kind of malaise and, and the, the difficulty? Is it still like lingering? It's lingering. Um, I definitely see way more anxiety in my incoming freshmen mm -hmm. than I used to back in the glory days before the pandemic. And I'm also still teaching online because some students have pre preferred not to come back. So uh, when I go back in the fall, I'll be teaching uh, one class online and two in person. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel, do you see like a clear line, do you think? Um, you know, because I'm, I don't know, I'm sympathetic to like Jonathan Hayes, uh, our stuff about the, the, how the phone influences anxiety and, and the way that there's been a shift, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago with the, with the iPhone um, and plus just the way we're raising kids to, to sort of be more anxious. It, it, is it like a, do you see a clear line where things have changed because of the pandemic, do you think? Or do you think it's just accelerated a trend that was already there? Um, so... In the whole time I've been teaching, kids have been obsessed with their phones because I, I, I didn't really start teaching until about 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and the iPhone was the phone, the smartphone was already well established at that point. So I, I think it was bumbling along like this and maybe going up like this. And then the pandemic made it do this oh, yeah. mm -hmm. because students were just spending so much time on their own, um, just getting obsessed with TikTok and uh, online forums and other things just and then not being socialized um, and not getting the experience of being in groups with their peers. So uh, I always, in my English 101 class, I have my students um, give a presentation of their research project. And uh, some of them are just almost incapable now of, of, of standing in front of a class and delivering a coherent presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, which other people are asking about too, is your work as an editor. Um, so oh. you were the editor of Raintown Review for a long time. Um, people are saying that it's not online right now. I know you pass it to Quincy Lear, right? So he was taking over it. Um, yeah. Do you know what, what the situation is with Raintown? Because a few people have asked. Jimmy Pappas wanted to know. I didn't. I did it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you, how long have you been editing Rats uh, For me, it's been almost tw or more than 20, I think. Wow. Yeah. No, no, just, just 19. Um, yeah. It's... Uh, I got burned out and mm -hmm. uh, to be honest I would have I would have dropped editing completely uh, as in editing a literary journal except that of course when Kim passed away I promised to take over Mezzo Camin mm -hmm. so I now edit Mezzo Camin but that's a lot less stressful than Raintown because it's online only mm -hmm. no print process no one else is involved it's just me yeah um, so well 10 years I mean I get paid so it's it makes oh, it yeah, much I never easier. Got yeah, I, never got I know. I mean, I and I've started journals myself just for fun, and it, the fun lasts, you know, six months, a year, and then it becomes a job, and you're like, oh, I'm doing a job yeah. but not getting paid. So how did you even, how did you manage to last that long? I don't know. It was before <laughs> I got involved in politics. I, yeah. I just I got to the point where I was spread too thin, you know, mm -hmm. and I I can't remember exactly whether I gave up Raintown before I I got involved in politics. But it was all around the same time. It's like you, there's only so many things you can do. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Do really well. And I like to do things well. So I um, I was done at that point. So so what is it um, in the process of being an editor that you learned about writing? Did it inform your process a lot or, or not as much? Um, th that's a good question. Uh, I, I think everything that I have been involved in informs my process. Uh, you know, teaching poetry, which I also do in addition to teaching at the community college, I teach poetry at West Windsor Arts Centre. Um, and that has definitely uh, informed my own writing. And I see it's so much easier to see missteps in other people's work than it is in your own. Mm -hmm. and, and same with editing, you know, sometimes a poem will come in, you, you must be in the same situation and you see the poem and you think, damn, this poem is almost perfect if it wasn't for that. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you're tempted to go back to the poet and say, hey, you know, like, hey, do you fix this? Do you think? But it never works out well in my experience. No, do it doesn't actually. I mean, a few times it does. You know, yeah, it has worked out well, but mostly they're mm -hmm. just very defensive. And like, yeah, okay, yeah what usually works is to d well. delete this line and it'll be fine. Yeah. That works. But but you change this line and like lines. fix this because something's not quite right. That it yeah. just may, it goes down some kind of spiral of, of ineffectiveness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, and and so um, so tell us t also about um, a mezzo camin. Um, what is it that you're? Well, you know, this is Kim Bri um, Kim Bridgeford's um, mm -hmm. project. Can you explain what it is about? Because I think it's a great great um, publication, and people would probably right. be interested. Oh yeah, I mean, I hope so. I, there's literally a new um, issue up just out. I think I put it out last week. Uh, it is a um, online journal of poetry by women only, mm. or people who self-identify as women. Um, that has allegiance to form, and that is um, interpreted relatively loosely. You know, again, as we've been discussing, I don't think form should be a straitjacket, but I don't want to publish free verse poems where it's just you know, all over the place and nothing, there's no, no guiding principle of structure as we discussed. So um, it comes out twice a year. Uh, it's supposed to be January and June. It's usually February and July. Um, and uh, the, it's an online process entirely. So you can go to submittable. You can um, submit like usually three to five poems, mm -hmm. usually publish two poems by every poet. It's very pretty. I didn't have anything to do with designing it. That was all Kim Bridgeford. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not that burdensome mm -hmm. because as a teacher, I'm off for Christmas and I'm off in the summer. So the I read submissions only really across the winter break and during the summer. And I, the rest of the time, I just let them pile up. <laughs> um, so we'll do two more questions from the audience here and then and one, one last poem, I think, if you don't mind. Um, no, not at all. Okay. I have one. The okay, quarantine. Um, so, um, so Dick Westheim wants to know, are there other journals taking formal work that you like? Is there any recommendations? I, I mean, I, we always talk about Able Muse and, and what they right. do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they do so many, much, but but who else do you um, who else do you like these days? Well, you know, I love Rattle. <laughs> well, <thanks. laughs> um, I really need to send out some more uh, some more poetry um, that has gone by the wayside a little bit lately. But um, what, what else is there? River Sticks is one that they they like formal poetry. The Atlanta Review, mm -hmm. um, I've been in that a couple of times. The Birmingham Review, that's another one I've been in there. Um, what yeah. about the Hudson Review? Because that's Hudson one Review. I've never in my life seen. I, I know that it's like nice, but they don't have much of an online presence. I've never seen a copy, no. but they have a great reputation. Yep. And I have not been in it. I have submitted to it. And okay. I have I think you have to submit by post, don't you? I think some of them you still do. I think you do. A lot of them are um, associated with universities, mm -hmm. which uh, I, I prefer the idea of an independent journal. I like that Rattle isn't mm -hmm. associated with a university and nor is Mezzo Camin. You know, it, it, it gives you a little bit more independence, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, well, we definitely take advantage of that. That's for sure. I don't, I don't know if it'd be around anymore if it was at a university. Um, yeah. So a question uh, from Judith Fay, which this is kind of a general question, um, but but can you talk a bit about your British-American duality? And it was Ooh. interesting because I, before you got to your mother, I was thinking that that might be somehow the metaphor of coming across you know, from Britain to oh. the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of anticipating a little bit of a shift in there if that comes in. And then it ended up not being about that at all. So what can you say right. about that? Also running for political office here in the States, um, you know. Right. Well, I mean, I've been here since 2000. So I've been here 22 years at this point. I'm sorry for anyone who thinks that my accent should have gone more American. It just doesn't. Oh, it's it's great. It, you know, poetry nothing, it I, I wish I could fake a British accent. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I... Uh, the whole thing about becoming an American, which we did in 2009, uh, we did because we thought America was going in the right direction. And mm -hmm. yeah, there was a lot of, uh, of hope. <laughs> that... There was a lot of hope and change. Yeah. Like, and, um, and now it's a little, but then Britain isn't in much better shape. So mm -hmm. these unfortunate polarizing forces are happening throughout the world. And uh, so I wouldn't ever start thinking about going back to Britain because of that. Um, but, but you know, people say, which 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 country do you prefer? And I mean, that's an impossible question to answer. You know, I love both these countries. I will never be one hundred percent American, but I am also not now one hundred percent English. I'm sort of from a small island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and a lot. It's actually interesting because my the book, the manuscript I'm putting together right now is going to try and deal with these issues, mm -hmm. right? And the, um, the Hero Crown of Sonnets that I may or may not be sending you has some elements of that too. And there are a lot of other poems in the potential manuscript that talk about what it means to have moved 3000 miles and not be long really to either country anymore. Yeah. And what was it that brought you here? 
Oh, it was my husband's job, very prosaic. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was the kids who were born in England, but they got, both got themselves into a position where it was impossible to move them for different reasons. So my eldest became very involved in gymnastics, which was not at the time a big thing in England. She was really good. Um, and so that was a problem. And then my youngest had some um, issues that made her very change averse. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't take a five-year-old who has got some sort of mental problems with change and dump her back in a country with a completely different educational system where everyone makes fun of her accent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So and we just stayed and then we became citizens. We became citizens in part because America's immigration system is so wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah. like I, we went, once we got to a position where the kids were old enough and we were traveling, we were like, well, what happens if you know we we the plane we're in goes down? Mm. Oh, they get shipped back to England. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they're not English. Yeah, I mean they're really not English. Like you wouldn't if you met them in the street, you wouldn't know they weren't from New Jersey, right? Um, so we had to become citizens so they could be citizens. Yeah, my, my father-in-law just became a citizen from Canada and just the, huh. the, it took 10 years and a lot of, you know, money and effort and paperwork. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's work. It's work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, let's finish up with one last poem. What do you want to want to close out with? Well, actually, I'm going to read a poem from the Quarantina Chronicles because I think it, um, it speaks to a number of the threads that we've covered today. Um, this is perhaps one of the more overtly political poems in this book. And it is definitely attempting to say a thing about people's experience, people's lived experience in the United States. And uh, it's called, She'd Worked for Almost 30 Years at the Hospital. And uh, the epigraph is Detroit health worker, care, sorry, Detroit healthcare worker dies after being denied coronavirus test four times, or just said, and that was from NBC News, 25th of April, 2020. And the thing you obviously need to know about this healthcare worker is that she was African-American. She'd worked for almost 30 years at the hospital. In March, she experienced symptoms of coronavirus and drove there, but was refused a test. A week later, later she was refused a second test and again sent away from that hospital. The third time they said she most likely had the virus and to stay home as if she had coronavirus. The fourth time she went, they also didn't test. The fifth time, her family carried her to a different hospital. In this hospital, she died of the virus, proved by the test. Yeah, heartbreaking poem there. And it, your poem choices have like read my mind because <laughs> I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, um, moving here that they gave up the NHS. <laughs> which, yes, I yes. mean, I'm mean, even me. Like I, I like, uh, you know, looking at science stuff. Uh, the amount of data for the coronavirus, I, it all comes from the UK because they have a great system and so much yeah. monitoring, and we have nothing but a hodgepodge of messy crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but anyway. <laughs> Um, it has been just great. It's a pleasure talking to you, Anna. And these two books are just wonderful. Um, thanks so much for being a guest today. Oh, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. And I hope you do send that uh, heroic crown. I shall do it tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, good night. Okay. Bye. Um, yeah, that was Anna Evans um, with her uh, most recent books, um, Under Dark Water, Surviving the Titanic, and of course, uh, The Quarantina Chronicles. And um, if you're paying attention, we'll do the um, tell you what the next week's prompt is going to be a little early, just in case people are cutting out. You might want to see it um, because it, it was uh, inspired by by Anna right there. This is the uh, prompt for this week. Choose for next week. Choose a local news article. Um, follow Anna M. Evans' process from the Quarantina Chronicles. Make a word cloud from the text. Write a tri tritina using the three most common words as its line endings. Um, so write a Quarantina Chronicle type Tritina. So uh, you're going to take the words from an article. But I want it to be a local article, though, because I don't want everybody to write about the same thing. So find a no local news story um, and then do this process, this generative process that Anna was using. And that is going to be your prompt for next week, so uh, just so you know. And, um, but we're going to take a quick break and go to uh, Open Lines. And uh, the prompt for this week, I guess I could tell you right now just to remind you, um, the prompt for this week was to write a poem about a f the movie you've seen the most often. Write a poem about the movie you've seen the most often. That was a prompt for this week. If you'd like to share a poem about that, um, feel free to share them on the open lines. You can also share poems about current events, like Poets Respond poems. You can also share ekphrastic challenge poems. I always forget to mention that. Um, you can share poems that you've published recently and are proud of and would like to, like to spread around. Uh, if you have a link, I can, 
I can uh, put that on screen and, and show off the journal at the same time, which is always fun. Um, so how you do it, if you'd like to share poems, is uh, I'll put the things up. First, email your poem to open mic. That's openmic at rattle.com. Openmic at rattle.com. Email your poem there or a link to it if it's online. And um, then I can show it on screen as you read, like I did for Anna and um, the earlier guests. And then find the Zoom link, which I am deploying into the chat windows right now. Here it is on Facebook. Um, I will pin it to the top. If you can't find it, just scroll all the way to the top. Um, here it is on YouTube. Same thing. It should be pinned to the top in just a second. So just join me over there. Only, though, only if you would like to share poems. If you don't want to share poems, just sit tight right where you are and listen and enjoy some open mic poems. But, uh, but if you'd like to share, how, what you do is you shut off your stream or at least mute it. Then come over on Zoom and um, don't watch on YouTube. Just join us on Zoom if you'd like to share poems. And that way uh, you won't get confused with delays and stuff and echoes and things. Um, but just uh, do that. So come over to that Zoom link if you'd like to share poems. We'll get to as many as we can today. And I will be right back in just a moment after a really quick break. So hang tight and I'll see you soon. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Um, as I mentioned, the prompt was to write a poem about the movie you've seen most often. And uh, this was our poem. Uh, this is my prompt. It's a, a sonnet to. And um, it's kind of self-explanatory, so I won't say anything. But this is my poem, Lost in Translation, it is called. Lost in Translation. Most nights those months we'd watch a DVD despite your being a thousand miles away. It didn't matter what the movie was, if we could synchronize our press of play. Drowsily, you'd count us down from three, as if our love could violate the laws of time and space, the distance by decree dissolved, our fingers touching anyway. Through the phone, we'd hear our breath, that's all. So what if we were out of things to say? Somewhere around the second act, you'd fall asleep. But with that spinning disc, I'd stay. We hardly ever watch it now, because it doesn't matter what the movie was. That is Lost in Translation, a sonnet. And yeah, that's me and Megan from our long distance relationship. Um, I think we have watched it a couple times um, since then, but not very often. Um, so that is my um, uh, prompt poem for the week. Let's see what everybody else has. Let's go to uh, Dick Westheimer first, because I've been going to him later lately. Hey, Dick, how you doing? I'm doing great. I just loved your poem. Oh, and... Thanks so much. That was that was really sweet. I, I decided not to do one because mine was 2001, A Space Odyssey, Ooh. which every time I saw, I was, let's just say, under the influence of some sort of <laughs> not performance, non-enhancing drugs. So. No. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, we just watched it with the kids, actually. And uh, we had a big a big disagreement about whether or not they could handle it because it was too, kind of slow, but fascinating. And um, I think they they pretended to like it. <laughs> I think it was the, yeah, that's the, interesting. Was I showed it to my kids, and they didn't make it through. And this was twenty years ago. You know, I rented a what were the VHS. Mm -hmm. I remember those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's been a long time. I, we just uh, I was walking around a garage sale and saw a whole row of VHS, and I was like, wow, that is uh, that's old. <laughs> so so, what do you want to share, uh, Dick? Uh, so um, I sent you um, a little tiny. A 12 line poem called Upon Gazing at the First Image Sent Back from the Beginning of Time. Um, yeah, I have right here from another web. We, I, got, I loved all the poems I got from, uh, from this and Poets Respond this week um, from the web's uh, deep field image. Yeah, so this, this is from the uh, deep, web's first deep field. It actually has a name uh, if you look it up on. Oh, online. really? Interesting. Yes, as web's first deep field. So uh, there it is. 
So upon gazing at the first image sent back from the beginning of time, they unzipped the sky and galaxies fell out scattered over the cosmos like so many loosened leaves. I am not supposed to see such things. The inside of the heavens turned out to know of these Delphic secrets made of dust. It's a promiscuity to gaze into worlds so far from here when I've not adequately loved this one called home. Oh, well, great ending, love that. Thanks for sharing that, Dick. Um, uh, did you want to read another poem? I think we only. Uh, I'll one. do uh, since you mentioned the, um, uh, if we have time, the uh, ekphrastic challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, since those are out in the open, uh, do you have access to that? Yeah, I could pull it up if I scroll down. I think. Yeah, here we go. I also, I also could read the pantoum that I wrote about the, um, if that would be faster. The pantoum. No, I have it right here. Go ahead. This is the ekphrastic challenge poem, which we just, um, you know, passed on. I'm sorry to say today because. Uh, um, but fighting Lake Minakwa. Minakwa, yes. And I will pull from here the bow that I pulled down from the attic to write the poem about. Oh, wow. Um, so I've had some, I had, I had a lot of fun with this one. Finding Lake Minakwa. Um, nine year old me shivers on the shore of Lake Minakwa. I hated that lake. Nothing good happened there. Never caught a fish and the ice had barely melted by the time camp started. I watched the big boys climb the dock trusses, cannonball into blue water, their shrieks like fingernails dragged across beat up aluminum canoes. A junior counselor slaps me too hard on the back, grins a bare teeth grin. Go on, he chides, get out there, jump. All I think about is shrinking balls and big boy's hands tugging down my swim trunks. A trickle of pee warms my leg. I squinch my eyes, barely hold on to my tears and miss my mom who left me here at Camp Golden Eagle for eight weeks of taunts and soaked bed sheets. I was the one who wore leather soled shoes while the others sported with it beat up sneakers and the kid who hid behind the bunks in cabin one while the others played pickle or went whooping to the cracked asphalt tennis courts. I'd head up to the archery range where old man Red was mending fletches. He'd see me coming, fetch my bear brand recurve. I loved that bow, the tension when stringing it, cupping its hickory grip, fingering the silk winding on the string where I'd knock the arrow. I'd root my feet close my eyes and count my heartbeats. One, two, three, and loose the shaft. See the fletch feathers ripple over the arrow rest and watch the shaft thwack into the straw bale stacked down range. Today, I found my old bow up in the attic, the string slack, still intact, the wood worn glassy by my own kid's grips. But I can't find a fondness for that lake anywhere. I string the recurve, knock a cedar arrow, and draw the bow tight. After all these years, the heel of my hand feels so at home rested against my cheek. I aim, close my eyes, breathe deep, and see through that fog for the first time the dawn black trees on the far shores of Lake Minaqua. Another great ending, and, and that's a uh, you know these uh, ekphrastic challenge. I don't know if I can pull up the image really fast, but um, but it was that it's the cover of the young, Rattle Young Poets anthology, and that's the kind of sense of um, it, it brought up a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. So it was really cool reading all the poems and cool to see that bow. Thanks for sharing that, Dick. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jim. Yeah, take care. And yeah, so if anybody has uh, if you have two poems as long as they're not too long, feel free to do two. I think we have plenty of time. Let's who I can't remember who I was. Um, let's go to a first time caller. I can't remember who who what order I went last week. Let's go to Karen Marker. Hello. Hey, Karen. Thank how you doing? You. Thank you. I just so love this show, and I love today's present presentation with Anna and what you just read. I love that poem that you just read, and I, I had written a poem on the lake as well, but oh, I, I don't have it here to read to you. I I actually reworked it, and I. 
I, I was so inspired by that image. And, mm -hmm. and I also loved the poetry of the children in that book. Um, yeah, it was a good one. I think it was oh. the, the first Young Poets anthology was the best. It was amazing. And this one is, is right up there. It's the first time I think it's lived up to that first one. They're really great poems in it. Yeah, they are really great. And, and that picture just really captured it for me. And I grew up in a lake like that. So um, I, I was going, I, I had not watched over and over um, one movie I was initially thinking of writing about, and I tried to write about it, everything, everywhere, all at once. Mm -hmm. I only wrote, watched it once. And I had tied that in with with the birth of a, my child, the, my first birth, and pictures of the space station. But I, um, instead today, I really want to <laughs> read a poem that um, is it's called After the Supreme Court Ruling, Medusa Speaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have um, it right here. And, yeah. yeah, and I, I just want to say these words out loud because it's something that I, I keep uh, um, wanting to use poetry as a curse <laughs> and as power. <laughs> yeah, well, perfect. I mean, Anna was talking about exactly that. So perfect, <laughs> exactly. perfect time today. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. go ahead. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, okay. After the Supreme Court ruling, Medusa speaks. I dare you look at me, you jurist sitting supreme after the ruling, look at my beauty cast with snake hair hissing venom. Where you dare tread forbidden now spilling menses, moons, mothers, midwives. All of this never yours to take. Look again how my muse memory and madness makes mockery of your manhood Fates and furies curse your court rules broken. See what happens. It is your own cold stone stare, the scream you carry, your face frozen forever in horror. Yeah, powerful poem. Thanks so much for that. That was after the Supreme Court ruling Medusa speaks. I, I'm hoping it's all going to come back. <laughs> and there is a little bit of that. <laughs> for sure. Thanks for saying it. And where are you calling from, Karen? from oakland california ah, very cool yeah great to see you. glad you could uh, join us today thank you so much yep take care uh yeah it was karen marker with um after the supreme court ruling medusa speaks let's go to um angela gartner hi tim how are you good how are you doing angela good yeah i can so relate with anna when she talks about when you guys were talking about how, because I'm a journalist, so uh -huh. sometimes it's hard to write poetry and <laughs> kind of put it out there because I'm taught not to tell anybody how I feel, really. Mm -hmm. You just kind of write the facts and you go. So sometimes it's hard for me to write um, and really open, like, really, like, open myself up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, what well, is it that I you want to share? I, I am going to do my poet's respond poem because okay. I thought it was kind of funny. So, and actually relates to one of my favorite movies is Jaws. So, mm -hmm. because um, I guess in Greece, um, what happened is that, so he kind of got swept, him and his friend got swept away to sea. And unfortunately, the last I heard that his friend, they are still looking for him, but mm -hmm. um, he um, found, you know, a, there was a, so a football or soccer ball, um, floating in the, he, he saw it and he held on to it and he, and supposedly held on to for like, you know, he, they said like 18 hours and he was floating with the soccer ball until they rescued him. So I just, I was thinking about that scenario. Like, I can't imagine, I, I know a lot of people were you know, when it first posted on Twitter, like they were talking about Wilson, mm -hmm. but Wilson was a volleyball, not yeah. a soccer ball. But <laughs> yeah, this is cool. And this was one of those ones where I had to read the story when I got the what poem because I wanted to see the ball. <laughs> and I was imagining because um, I do call it football. So I was imagining it as an actual football, you know, an American football. Um, but yeah, we had it on screen. I, I showed everybody just now. Why don't you go ahead and read this? Uh, floating with a soccer ball in the sea. Floating with a soccer ball in the sea. I have a fear of drowning, feeling tugged by an invisible anchor falling below the waves and touching the sandy bottom, to be abandoned by friendly dolphins like the ones in the movies. I would be alone with no grassy hills, rocky edges to take hold of, 
My feet would be desperate to stand. If a deflated sports ball kept me up above the water and the fish would kiss my pruny toes, I would scream until my mouth went dry, swallow the salty water, dream to eat them because I'm hungry. Very good. Yeah, another another nice story. I, I didn't realize the friends were still missing, but uh, but cool that that he was rescued by the ball. What a what a miracle. Yeah, it was it was an interesting story, but I I just don't know if I would be calm in that situation. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so. yeah, for sure, it would be tough. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Thank, thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Bye. Okay, let's go. We're just going to go in order because I can't remember what order was last week. I'm sorry. But uh, let's go to Guy Chambers next. Hey, Guy. Hi, Tim. How's it going? I'm doing great. Having a wonderful night of poetry here. I'm really enjoying yeah. it. Uh, what do you have for us? I actually just want to say about the book that Anna written up, but Under the Dark uh, Waters. I thought that, that was well written. Really it, awesome. You know, it's it written, really is. It, it's an experience. I mean, some books yeah, aren't it's... experiences. This was like, you know, it felt like watching a great movie or something or, or even more. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a great book. Yeah, it was a good concept. Everything was well done, I thought, you know, so. Okay, I got two poems here. I didn't get a poem poem, but I got these two poems here. I got just got published here a couple of weeks ago in a newspaper up here in uh, in, uh, Shore Park here, Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be lucky they'd be publishing a few of my poems here. It's in the Never Been Better section. Oh, very cool. Yeah, we have a whole uh, group online, uh, which was very inactive. I would like it to be more, which is the poetry, what's it called? We call it Lit Vent or something takeover trade mag takeover but we want to find alternative oh. places to publish poems so it's a way place oh, yeah. for tips like that and uh, it's cool when newspapers actually do it yeah so the, the, this first one here i like to keep it a little positive here because you always want positive posts but first one is called relax hey picture oneself having tea with the fishermen sipping tea off the ocean breeze sitting on a wooden stairs by the shoreline, watching a cat walking daily across the porch railing, birds chattering at each other on the telephone lines, boats sailing passionately, the sails waving in the wind. Uh Uh-oh, you still there, guy? He froze. Um, maybe turn off your, let's see, turn off your video. Well, I'll finish, I'll finish the poem for you. So relaxing on a current of fresh air. Oops, what did I do? Okay, well, um, let's see. Am I still broadcasting? Because something just cut Moments. Down. Moments of threads. Blue. Red. Green, gold, weaving them to make a day. Hey, guy, my, uh, guy, let me cut you off, guy. My, uh, for some reason, mm-hmm. my, my Zoom dropped. You froze, then my Zoom disappeared. So uh, can you read moments again from the start? Okay. Okay. Moments. Moments of threads. Blue, red, green, gold. Weave them to make a day. Excellent. That's sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that, guy. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I, I I wonder what's going on with my. That's the second time something's dropped on my computer. Um, I'm a little worried that um, with the heat, it's actually overheating. But we'll <laughs> we'll see. Um, anyway, let's go. Uh, let's go to a first time caller. Claudia Gary's here. Um, hey, Claudia, you're there. Hi. Hi, hey, Tim. Hi, yeah. everybody. Nice I don't think you've been again. on before. Yeah, good to see you. Not, I, not on this format, anyway. It's a long time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, thank that's you. right. When well, we were on Sty- Skype a yeah, couple years yeah, ago, maybe yeah, you were exactly. on once. Yeah, yeah, well, it's great to see you. What really do you have to wonder- share? Good to see you. I'm really great that you had Anna um, Yeah, Yeah, definitely today. my pleasure. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to read this little poem called Dire or Nice. It's in Expansive Poetry Online. Okay, let me... I, I sent you the link. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Me, um, hang on one second, because I have your... Okay. Let me try to find it. Yeah, okay. It was the first email. Yeah, I don't see the first email. The first email go to spam. I see oh, the second sorry. one from a Mezzo company. Oh, my. Sorry. Hmm. Uh, spam. Just give me one second. 
Well, I mean, if you can't find the first one, I could read the shorter poem in the second one. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, huh, that is strange. Yeah, I don't see the second email. Yeah. Do you want to do... This is from Mezzo Kamen. Or okay, yeah, Mezzo Kamen. Mezzo Kamen, yeah. yeah. That's Anna's. That's the, the magazine that Anna edits. So, um, yeah, this second poem here is called A Meditation on Relationships. So a little bit of a light light poem um you said i must be really getting into this guacamole thing it's all about the day we bought tomato lime cilantro and avocado too late to back out that day was love commitment was what followed although you stalled till one poor fruit expired a ripe tomato liquefied and hollowed during the week we'd been too busy tired or just not hungry for the green concoction those elements had promised they could form. You knew I didn't have the heart to watch them all wilt and pucker. Love, no longer warm, lingered as memory or just belief that something good might happen if we'd simply walk through the recipe to avoid grief. The avocado, taciturn and pimply, did not entice our appetites a bit. But never mind, onto the cutting board it went where all but brittle skin and pit were chopped into a bowl and then ignored. While fresh cilantro leaves were finely minced, a lime quartered and squeezed down to its rind, rind and cumin sprinkled in. We were convinced by then that these ingredients refined into their lumpy essences and thrown together tasted better than alone. Oh, that was excellent. A meditation on relationships, uh, Claudia Gary. And that is That's from... How, how do you say that? Mezzo? I, I never remember. Oh, Mezzo Camin. Yeah. Mezzo Camin. I'm going to have to try to remember. But you can find that if anybody <laughs> wants to look up this, this wonderful journal. Um, it's M-E-Z-Z-O, um, C-A-M-M-I-N, mezzocamin.com. So thanks so much, Claudia, for, uh, for sharing that. And, and bringing a great evening. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Bye. It was Claudia Gary with a great poem. Let's go to Carla Schwartz. Hey, hi, can you hear me? I can. Good to see you, Carla. Good to see you too. Um, I, I'd like to read two, and but instead of reading the two uh, film poems that I sent you, I'll read one of them and then the other one, I would read my acrostic poem from this month, which is called Summer. Okay, great. Let me uh, pull this up, two poems. So we have the... So the start with Summer and the other one that I'll pull up after that is um, Barbarian Invaders. Okay, summer. So summer is um, okay. So let me pull it up over here. Um, okay. Great. All right. Are you ready? Um, still working on it. So this was the Ephrastic Challenge poem, "Summer." There it is. I found it. Okay. 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 So it's up. Yep. Go ahead. Summer. A hot June day, just after school lets out for summer. As the last bell rings, we kids run out the door through the field behind the school parking to the trail through the woods that lead to the lake. The land there always floods this time of year, but rotting timbers from the old pier still hold their stance enough for Tommy to shimmy up a pylon and leap. The water chilled from last winter's ice makes your heart jump. My turn next, as I wait for Tommy to plunge in and swim out of the way. I look straight out to the mountain across the lake where Tommy's mid-air shrieks echo back. I count to 10, say over and over, I can do this, I can, before I push myself off, screaming all the way. Excellent, Sonnet, thanks for sharing that summer. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. And that goes again with the, um, I really wish I had a quick way to pull it up for people watching, but you've seen the, uh, you've probably seen the, the Young Poets Anthology um, cover. And um, let me see if I can actually remember the URL just off the top of my head. Um, um, let's see. Oh, there it is. So I can show it. So this is this was it. This is the uh, the image that we're we're writing after. This wonderful cover by um M. A. Murphy from Canada um of um kids jumping into a lake during the summer. Um that was the Ecrastic Challenge uh um image for this week. Um okay, and so the other poem you wanted to share. 
Barbarian was, Invaders. Yes, Barbarian Invaders, uh, which is after Barbarian Invasions by Denis Arcan. I actually used to write a lot of poems about film. I haven't written one in very long. And so this poem, um, so this uh, poem was inspired by that film by Denis Arcan. It's his 2003 follow-up to The Decline of the American Empire, which was the 1986 film. And he used the same actors that 15 years later. Um, and he incorporates 9-11 attacks into the second film. And so this is called Bar Barbarian Invaders. That death is inevitable is why we bite big of life, soar, sail. That barbarian invaders may take it away in instant replay on the telly, return again and again while journalists have to stay home Christmas, hold down the fort for the fear of them, chisels the crystal of life. For those of us who survive the barbarian invasions, take toll the ruin, the carnage, the particulate memory we can't bury. We kick butt to hang on, banter with loved ones, know that all we really need as we live to die, that very mainline fix is love. Uh, excellent. Thanks so much. I'm going to have to check out that movie, Barbarian Invasions. Um, thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Oh, thank you, Tim, for everything. Great night. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Take care. Yeah. Okay, let's go next to um, Caitlin Buxbaum. Hey, Caitlin, how you doing? Uh-oh, um, you're not coming up. I think you're, uh, let's see. It's not your uh, Zoom. It's your microphone or something. Okay, she says one second. There you go. How about now? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Great to see you. I forgot last time I had used the headset, I had used my mic because I was recording music. Uh huh. My off headset mic. Oh, so. very cool. Oops, it didn't change the default back. No problem. It's good to see um, you. So, what do you have to uh, share with us tonight? So, um,. I have a poem that is on the prompt, but also on a painting because this yesterday I was, and today actually, I'm doing um, the Lucky Seven Ecfrastic Marathon oh, interesting. with the Ecfrastic Review. And let me tell you, it is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the challenge was to write um, 14 drafts in seven hours so take a half an hour to write um your piece whether it was flash fiction or a poem mm -hmm. and so i did seven yesterday and that's all i could get through and i've i think i've done like five today that's i don't know i have three more whatever the math is <laughs> that, that, that's a lot i don't know i mean they're they're serious about so the ecfrastic over there and that's ecfrasticreview.net is that the website I, I think, think it's just ecfrastic.net. Okay. Well, well, we'll check it out after you share your poem. But this is a after New York movie by Edward Hopper, one of the great Edward Hopper paintings. Yeah. Um, so also at the end of the challenge, at the end of the month, you like you do the challenge in these day or two, and then you submit up to five of your pieces mm -hmm. to the contest. And so this one, I don't think I'm going to submit to the contest, but um, yeah. Anyway, it's called um, Filmology. When I think of my most watched movies, Inception inevitably comes to mind. The winding spiral of dreams ever drawing me into the center of one man's imagination, fascination with time and depth. At every end, I lean back and think, I must have seen it all, and he has done it. Crafted a tale I won't ever forget, won't ever fully understand. But isn't that my own story? An unforgettable elevator ride into the memories I hold dearest, most fear? Perhaps I allow myself too much credit, more influence in industry than I possess. Nolan's genius is his, not mine. Still, I wonder who would sit in the theater of my life, seats upholstered in Hollywood carpet red, as if the scenes on screen were flush with something so utterly cinematic 
you'd pay almost any fee to see. The top begins to spin. I know it's almost over. Don't need to watch to know what happens or doesn't. But I can't look away and, well, resolution is overrated. That's great. I love that line. I wonder who would sit in the theater of my life. Cool thought. Thanks for sharing that, Caitlin. And I don't think I've ever seen Inception. So maybe that's a movie <sighs> suggestion because it seems like Keep I would like running it. into people who yeah. haven't seen it. And I think I've literally seen it 10 times. Although, although Megan probably, when, if she's watching this, is like, we've seen it four times. What are you talking about? Because I'm the kind of person that's just, I'm a goldfish. So I don't know. Maybe I have, but I don't have any. I, I remember the trailer, but I don't remember actually seeing the movie. So I, I want to watch yeah, it now because I do my, remember the trailer looks really cool. So um, my parents are like that too they're like we haven't seen this and i was like yes you have yeah, i was there yeah. um yeah, but i'm a big me. nolan fan and i wish i could have put more of the movie in this poem but mm -hmm. this is how it worked out so yeah very cool well thanks for sharing that caitlin always a pleasure yep bye, bye. Okay, let's go to jennifer elise wang hey hey jennifer how you doing today I'm good. So I originally was going to combine the past two prompts and write a canzoni about oh, that's Lord of the Rings, <laughs> yeah. which is the movie I've seen tons of times. Oh, it's, a, it's a good one. But, we, we've only recently yeah. been inducted into that with the, you know, with the kids. It's something that we kind of sat around and, and binge watched over a couple of weeks. It's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, my canzoni went in a very weird direction, so I'm still working on it because <laughs> It, it got kind of interesting because I was like, well, I could just use certain words from the movie a lot. And yeah, it just went in a weird direction. So I submitted, uh, it's a poem I wrote in college where we, um, we watched Pride and Prejudice. The uh, I think it's directed by Joe Wright, starring Keira Knightley. We watched that movie so many times. It's, it was like our comfort film. Mm -hmm. And it was part of a trilogy of poems that I titled Men Who Can Do Room 123 No Wrong. Because oh, we had three men that we collectively agreed on that like we would date. And it was one of our friends, uh, the actor Michael Vartan and Fitzwilliam Darcy. And so that's the inspiration behind this poem. <laughs> so to Fitzwilliam Darcy. Dear Mr. Darcy, I must confess, I have not stopped thinking about you since you first appeared at the ball, where you caught the eyes of all the other ladies as well. Though you could not deign to introduce yourself, I still admired your impeccable, morose presence, rigid with pride, tall and still as a reed, above swaying grasses and pretentiously colored flowers. A gentleman who neither spends too much time gazing at his reflection, nor lets the wind decide where his lock should fall. For your arrogant disdain, I would have liked to despise you, but as handsomeness does not confer amiability, initial impressions can be unindicative of one's character. One glance sufficed to throw me into a tempest of contempt and infatuation, a tempest stirring behind your own eyes as words and thoughts are tossed about, words uttered only after much thought. I understand your desire to quell emotions rising up behind your stony facade, emotions I have concealed myself, but the words you utter awkwardly, even after careful thought, are more daggers than arrows, carving out my heart for your mercy. My agony, however, cannot comes not from the war between head and heart, nor my inability to articulate a suitable reply, but from my identity, for I am not your Elizabeth Bennet, though I must remain content with admiring you from afar, admire I shall continue to do. Always and never yours, a reader of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Fitzwilliam Darcy. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That, and I just want to say uh, there's a new movie out called Fire Island, and it is a brilliant reimagination of Pride and Prejudice. Oh, with really? I've heard of that, but I had no idea. That's a strange title for, for what it is. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, if you love different adaptations of Austin, that's a very nice twist that I recently saw. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing both of those things. All right. Thank you. Yep. Take care. And, um, before I forget, let me say that at the end of the at the show, I'm going to read that um, anonymous po member of U.S. Congress's poems we referenced before. Um, so stick tight, hang tight for that. And you'll get, you get to experience it, and, and you can speculate who it actually is. This is from it's from ten years ago. Um, but let's go to Bev Wendell Atherstone next. Hey, Bev, you there? Hey, how are you, Tim? Good, great to see you. How you doing? Great. 
Anna was just fabulous. I enjoyed that so she much. She was. Yeah, I've been looking forward to I've been meaning to ask her to be on for a long time. And then I finally, I think I just saw a Facebook post from her. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm supposed to ask you on. Um, so it's cool to have, uh, have Anna on. Um, so what is it you'd like to share? So it's from a prompt in January that you gave us. Ah. And that was to ask a question and then answer it in the poem. Ah, very interesting. And then this ends up being on spill words. Yeah, it's just been published by Spillwords this um, last week on Tuesday. Very cool. So I'll put that on screen. This is Spillwords. And the okay. website is spillwords.com. Um, so, yeah. So do check that out. Um, and, and what is the uh, what, what is the poem about? If, if the IMF's nature solution to climate change, is the IMF's nature solution to climate change possible? So what is they the... They think um, that if we, if we increase the whales by about two to three times, mm -hmm. we should be able to save the planet. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so that's what it's about. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Is the IMF's natural solution to climate change possible? The International Monetary Fund is not known for protecting the environment as its own. The climate economic threat must be severe for them to dare venture into a green sphere. The IMF report on CO2 pollution says increased whales are the natural solution. If we could just increase their population, it could reverse climate annihilation. Wherever the great whales survive, phytoplankton, the ocean's food supply, thrives. Fertilized by the behemoth's prodigious pooped plumes, Are you still there, and I oh. tiny middle plankton. Sorry, am I gone? Oh yeah, you broke it. You want to turn off your camera so it uh can keep I'll going. take off my camera. Going. Yeah. Tell me where to start again. Yeah, I'm um, start at the research shows. I'll just start again. Okay. The International Monetary Fund is not known for protecting the environment as its own. The climate economic threat must be severe for them to dare venture into a green sphere. The IMF report on CO2 pollution says increased whales are the natural solution. If we could just increase their population, it could reverse climate annihilation. Wherever the great whales survive, phytoplankton, the ocean's food supply thrives, fertilized by the behemoth's prodigious pooped plumes. Rich in nitrogen and iron, again, the algae blooms. From these tiny, mighty phytoplankton comes half of all Earth's life-giving oxygen. They sink as much carbon from the air as four Amazon rainforests could ensnare. Today, a third or fewer great cetaceans remain to circumnavigate their ocean-wide domain. Since whaling plundered right whales to the brink, decreasing blue whales to 3%, not quite extinct. An eco value of 2 million bucks for each Leviathan makes possible whale stocks might see some restoration. But only if mammoth fines for each one lost were set, for poaching, ship strikes, and bycatch in trawling nets. So to answer this existential question, let's encourage the IMF run with its natural suggestion and waste no time in their implementation to reverse the economic harm to our global ecosystem. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, is the IMF's nature solution to climate change possible? Very, very interesting. I, I'm going to have to look at the math on that. that that's an interesting idea. Thanks for sharing that, Bev. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. It's Bev Wendell Atherstone. Um, and then once again, that was from spillwords.com. If you'd like to find more, spillwords.com is the, uh, the website there. Um, and let's go to Brent Stauffer now. Hey, Brent, how you doing? Hey, Jim, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, so what do you have yeah. for us? Okay, well, I've, I've got a prompt poem. Uh, 
I just want to quickly say how much I've enjoyed the show. It's been really, really a top notch show. Yeah, it's been a good uh, show today. I've been very happy with it, except for the technological uh, issues I keep having. I've had two programs go off on uh, me, but uh, what, whatever. <laughs> well, uh, overall, though, it's, it's just been it's been a great success. Great. Um, yeah. So anyway, I wrote a prop poem, um, and it's it's funny when I was thinking about it. The my favorite movies aren't necessarily the movies that I've seen the most often. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting, yeah. And I, I, found, I found that interesting. Um, probably the movie I've seen the most is Star Wars because uh -huh. it came out when I was I came out when I was ten, and it was in the theaters for over a year. Oh, wow. And I would go and I would go and watch it two or three times in a row. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that a bunch too because it's just one of those things. Every few years, you're like, yeah, hey, let's watch Star Wars again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I couldn't think of anything interesting to say about Star Wars. And mm -hmm. um, another movie that I've seen a lot that I kind of resisted uh, talking about was Casablanca. Uh -huh. um, but then I remembered a particular time in my early twenties when I watched Casablanca, and so that's what this poem uh, is about. Okay, cool. That right. one time. That one time. Okay. <clears throat> Afternoon daily feature. When you're dying for a cigarette, don't watch Casablanca again for the 100th time, especially after a hot shower. And now, lying on the unmade bed in a very blue bathrobe like a languid corpse. Rick is smoking. Ilsa is smoking. Victor is smoking. Sam is smoking. The lounging policemen are smoking. The melancholy soldiers are smoking. The whole country is smoking. Your car has, and your car has died of thirst. Your wallet shriveled up from unwavering loneliness. The whiskey bottle in a corner bled dry from the night before. Take it from me. That's a bad time to watch Casablanca. <laughs> That's great. I love that. I love the repetition of the smoking. Very cool stuff. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I yeah, appreciate thanks, it. Is it, thanks, raining? Yeah. is it raining where you are? Yes, absolutely. Is. Yeah, yeah, I'm in the garage where, where I can be alone and, you know, and it's raining like that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, like, is that the sound of rain? I don't remember what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no no yeah, problem. No, but, but yeah, it's cool to hear. Thanks. Thanks. For, and, and take yeah. care, Brett. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Bye-bye. That was Brett Stauffer with the uh, Afternoon Daily Feature. And now Julian Matthews just popped on. Uh, let's ask Julian to unmute. Hey, Julian, how you doing? Hi. Hey, oh, we have an interesting background. I don't see uh, you, but I see a whale swimming through a bedroom. Oh, hey, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Hey, great to see you. Yeah. So uh, how you doing? I'm good. Um, so, what, uh, yeah, what do you have you like to share? Mythical Mornings. Okay, cool. I will pull it up right here. Anything you want to say about it before you go? So I wrote this in 2021 when they were finally allowing us to go back to see movies at theaters. Mm -hmm. And I, I just combined all my favorite movies in that and some strange mythology as well. How, how are things going there now? Is it uh, things sort of back to normal or is it everything still with the new waves and things? Are they, is it coming back? We have three members of my family who have COVID. Oh, really? How are they doing? Is numbers it, is have it shot up to 20, yeah. Numbers have shot up to over 20,000. Mm -hmm. uh, death rates are low, though, because, you know, we've had a very high vaccinations. So. Yeah. Well, that's good. Good so to that, hear. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's hear this. Yeah. Mythical mornings. Go ahead. Uh, so, 2021. Mythical mornings, I awaken and feel the taste of metal on my tongue like the copper coin I swallowed as a child. This was no holy communion, and I certainly wasn't in church. He appears like a vampire, a ghost, a creature from midnight mass. His sharp teeth gleaming in the dark, his long pole sloshing as the boat approaches. So this is it, my final journey, the last hurrah. My adornment... No adornment in a gilded Viking ship, no tunnel of light, no angels to lift me on high, no brass accompaniment, no choral singers, only a... Isn't that the sounds of Ennio Marconi from the Mission soundtrack in the distance? Sharon sticks a dirty curling nail in my mouth and takes his fare. I let him. There is no one else on board. 
It's a slow day, perhaps, on earth, which in a way is good news, I suppose. Or maybe my lot ascended while I descended, leaving me to float alone down the muddy sticks. Or maybe just like gliding down the Mekong once before, we would pick up others along the banks with their goats, chickens and bottles of honey. And Martin Sheen before the apocalypse. We're going to need a bigger boat, Sharon, I think. I say we as if Sharon and I are together a duo, part of a team like Vincent and Jules in Pulp Fiction, Bonnie and Clyde, Butch and Sundance, buddy assassins, natural born killers, twin villains in the villa now. The, pun, the puns could be verse. I look up at any hint of kinship in Sharon's pale countenance and realize he's no poet, no dancing pallbearer. There is no John Wick reflecting in his flaming eyes. Things couldn't be more somber or stark than the final scene when Iron Man dies. Thanos is dead, but Hades awaits. As the boat pushes forward, I hope Aquaman might pop up in his green tights and a Guinness to rescue me. Or Shang-Chi might swing by because it's 2021. And isn't it just great to have an Asian in an Asian role for a change? Bring down that Chinese wall and may the whitewash fall. I remember it was autumn when I departed, so at least I get to see Persephone. Maybe I could share a poem or two with her. She might be amused by my clever use of metaphors and maybe persuade Hades to let me go in the underworld. Can anyone hear you scream? Do I get to write my own ending, I wondered? Is this poem then just a vessel, one of the thousand that Helena Troy launched, or just another leaky ship, an ark without a covenant, mixing metaphors and mythologies, another cliched Greek tragedy, an avatar sequel that's never coming soon? Wait, is that vassal or vessel? Am I the poet, just a vassal for this vessel? There's a vast difference, you know, between the two. Sharon was tired from my ramblings. I didn't even realize he could hear me leans over and says with finality, this is no time to die. Oh, shucks, just when we were bonding, I awaken again. There are no exceptions to this inception. When you haven't seen a movie in a theater this long, it's like being stranded in a desert, a harsh desert planet with giant worms. Is June playing yet? Can we go now? Oh, that was great. Thanks so much. Great poem and great reading as always. I love that line, the puns could be verse. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that, Julian. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Great show. Yep, take care. That was Julian Matthews of Mythical Mornings. And um, so I'm going to end up the uh, close up the Zoom and finish up the show. I did want to share this poem, though, because we talked about it. <clears throat> this is from Rattle Number 36, way back in 2011. So, for, uh, so what's that, 11 years ago, I guess? And uh, this is stifled by anonymous member of the U.S. Congress. Here's stifled. Let me, uh... Stifled. We are jammed up by the mute, stubborn desire that we fail. Stifled. It's hard even to exhale or inhale. I'd love a fight of swinging fists, of sweating damp shoulders, of panting oaths and thudding blows. Anything is better than this slow and muffled cramp. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, yet every venture is coiled, tied down and snubbed in filaments of delay. We were not born for this, to have all that we assay, subjected to a cold-eyed banker's censure. Pilgrims we were, and progress was our due, new worlds to conquer, fresh wind across our bows. Far horizons sought and claimed and knew, but no, stopped, stuffed, and stifled we stall, and snared by men determined to be small. So that is how uh, members of Congress actually feel. <laughs> stifled by anonymous member of the U.S. Congress. Um, and let me see if there's anything else that I should share. Um, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Because um, i gotta, I got to tie this up. Um, so here is the uh, prompt for this week uh we already mentioned actually no the psyku for the week let me do the psyku really quick so this is the psyku for the week um and this is a um interesting interesting article from the association for psychological science um and see right here um experts don't always give better advice they just give more and um it goes in this study um talking about it, it set up an online game 
um, where you could learn and get better at it. And then it asked the people that were good to give advice and the regular people that, to give advice. And um, everybody thought that the experts gave the best advice, but it turned out that there was no bearing on how good you were at the game than um, giving advice and, and teaching somebody else. So it's like a totally separate skill to be able to teach someone something, then be good at it, is basically what this little research found. And um, it was just a coincidence reading this article because for my son, um, you know, we've been playing baseball a lot for the last year. He really got into it in the last year. And I love baseball. So um, we've been playing it a lot. And he just had this revelation that you're supposed to catch the ball in the pocket of the glove and not the palm. And in all these years, you know, the whole year of like playing catch with them all the time, I never thought to tell him something that like basic, which is the problem for um, <laughs> what this article points out, is that if you're good at something, you know, or you're, you know, and skilled at something, you don't think of things that other people might find helpful. So there's actually no relationship between um, how skilled you are at a task and how you, uh, uh, how well you teach it. So that's an interesting article um, applicable to my life uh, this week. And um, this is the prompt for, this is my psyku, I should say, for this week. Summer moon, catching a fly ball in the pocket. Summer moon, catching a fly ball in the pocket. Um, and that is the psyku for the week, and that is the show for the week. We already mentioned the um, next week's prompt. Um, I'll put it on screen one more time. It is to write one of those poems um, like Anna did from the Quarantina Chronicles. Choose a local, emphasize local. I want to see local stuff because it's just more interesting and more more diverse. Um, choose a local news article and then follow Anna M. Evans' process from the Quarantina Chronicles. So make a word cloud from the text and, and you can find, just type in word cloud. You can find a word, te- word cloud generator online, which helps a lot. Um, the other thing you can do is there's other things that list the number of times a word has appeared. So it will rank the frequency of use. I think Word might even, um, Microsoft Word might even do that as one of the, one of the options. Um, but find the, find the words that are most used in the article itself. And those are your three words that are used as line endings for your tritina. And that is the prompt for next week. But it actually is the prompt for two weeks because I'm sorry to say there's going to be no show next week. We're taking, we've had a long planned week off, a little bit of a road trip. Um, so it's going to be two weeks away is the next episode. you got two weeks to write this poem. Um, there's going to be nothing. There's also going to be no critique of the week on Friday this week either. We'll come back for next Friday's critique and then, uh, and then we'll do the show. The show two weeks from now is going to be with... Um, Heather Altfeld and her newest book, Postmortem. Um, and Heather, when I think of her, I mean, she just does amazing research. And this is a book of um, obituaries for all sorts of things, like objects and, and things throughout history. She, she does so much fascinating research and, and constructs these really interesting poems out of them. We have um, um, one of the poems that we published from this book is um, Piney's Traveling Apothecary. Um, and it's a... Um, um, a poem after that. Um, and so there's there's poems like that throughout this book, really fascinating subject matter. Um, and that is Heather Altfeld. Her book is Postmortem. That is going to be two weeks from now's guest, Monday, August 1st. So this is the last show for July already. Monday, August 1st, uh, Rattlecast number 143, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great two weeks, and I will talk to you soon. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>